and that is like the blazing sun over our shoulder. <laughs> Alexa, turn off go. living room light. Alexa, turn off living room light. Okay. Ah, that's better. Now you can see us. I mean, it was spotlighting the unit. It was. See, guys, we do use technology <laughs> as we're speaking to you on technology. Uh, yeah, technology. Looks like we're... Yeah. Our lighting game needs work. Yeah, well, that involves purchasing, like, real lights. Shall I get us ring lights? I have ring lights at home. We have a ring light. A. A ring light. One, I have two. One small ring light. Your shoe will go live in five seconds. Four. Three. Can I use them for my headshots? Two. One. We'll see. There we go. Lock Hulk Radio. All right. So, now we are live on Facebook. We got our friends with the Vibe Radio Network. And, yeah. Go ahead. Hi, radio people. Good evening, everybody. It's been a very, very long time since we spoke to you. One week. One whole week. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, this, uh, this... This getting... gets us back on schedule. To be fair, it is a very long week. It, yes. It was. It was. It and, was. Uh, but, yeah, getting this uh, show ready for you all tonight was a bit of a crunch. So uh... I did not include a story in Phoenix, and so Chris had to go hunting. You didn't need oh, to. Oh, yeah. You didn't need to admit to that. So, yeah, I sort of do feel like Phoenix definitely needs a... If we're, we're going to talk about Arizona, mention. we kind of need to throw Phoenix in somewhere. Uh, so, are we talking about Tombstone? Actually, we are not. How dare you? What? Did we do Tombstone? We also? did. I did the bird. Yeah, the birdcage. There's yeah. still more. Oh, I know, yeah, there but, is. But we have, we have touched on Tombstone before. Yeah, but like... It's Tombstone. Yeah. I mean, when we get to be like... I've got a it's in the two, name. I've got a parts two script started. But yeah. yeah but well, once we get to where we are, which we got to be... I, don't, I have to count. we got to be rolling up on like 100 episodes. Um, yeah, we, we need to... What are we going to do on our 100th? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, let me see. Face this. reveal. <laughs> sure, let me just pull this off. <laughs> Let's see. Our channel. We have. It's not going to tell me. That's ridiculous. Come on. Oh. So while Chris is counting, um, this coming yeah. Friday is our brand new tour coming out, uh, Shades Inspectors of Court N. Uh, so yeah, if you want to check that out, that's going to be awesome. Our fabulous tour guide Zoe's going to be giving that one. Uh, I'll be giving it later in the month, but she, uh, they are going to be doing the first one. So. Oh. No, actually, we got a little ways to go. We're this makes episode eighty-eight. Eighty. Oh so, yeah, we have some time to yeah. plan. Um, get streamers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we 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 should hit. Oh, you didn't like that noise. We should hit one hundred by the end of the year. I I'm guessing. Probably. Probably. Ish. It'll be close. It'll be close. Anyways, anyway, anyway, anyhow, yeah. We, tonight we are here to talk about Arizona. So um. It's a, a state that you have some familiarity with. Yeah, I lived in Arizona for a year. Yep. So, uh, not in a place that we're going to be talking about. Uh, you lived well, we've already talked about where I lived. That's right. Which London one? Bridge. London Bridge. Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Yep. They, they did, in fact, buy the actual London Bridge in London and took it apart and reassembled it there, and then London built a new London Bridge. And, well, apparently a couple of the ghosts came with. So... So, and as I only just found out, like in the last month, contrary to popular belief, they like to say that the guy that bought London Bridge thought that he was actually buying Tower Bridge. Mm -hmm. no, which is not true. He not really true. didn't know which bridge he was buying. He knew what he bought. They just like to spice it up a little bit and say he bought the wrong bridge. But I think it's still a it's pretty It's a fun little thing to say. It is. And it's, Especially as Americans, we love that stuff. Yeah. And uh, London Bridge still is it. I mean, it's a pretty bridge. It's a nice bridge. Yeah, it's a nice bridge. Nice bridge. But yeah, so um, yeah, we we are here to talk about Arizona. Uh, and uh, no, we we are not going to be touching on Tombstone because we've done that before. Uh, we're, we've already did London Bridge. <laughs> um, we might on a future episode may manage Cowboys? to. Cowboys. 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 We talking about cowboy ghosts? Uh, Have we done that? 
Miners. We got That's miners. That's not the same. No, it's not. Not even close. I know, but... Oh, no, I meant, like, as an episode. Wait, oh, 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 as an episode. No, we have not done an episode on cowboys. That's very specific. Guys, I'm like... <clears throat> Well, yeah, it's very sp- We did a show on pirates. I feel like cowboy ghosts are n- not as specific. And like, by cowboys, obviously, I kind of mean like outlaw. Like, you know, Wild yeah. West okay. heroes. There you're we al- go. You are Wild also- West villains and heroes I could probably do. You're also talking about doing a show for Columbus, Ohio. There's a lot of spooky stuff in Columbus, Ohio. Let me just tell you. I, I- feel like Ohio deserves a win. But at the same time, they really don't because they're still Ohio. I mean, I like dove down this rabbit hole and I got stuck in Columbus. So, I can't tell places. you. I got stuck in Columbus. I have like 15 stories from Columbus. But anyways. All anyways. the Ohioans that yeah. are listening, I'm sorry, but you know it's true. Yeah. We, we're, we digress. And we actually have, we, people are starting to tune in. We got like 10 people. All right. Oh, so, let's so, wow. Yeah. Time to go. I don't know where that came from. We were like one. Like, we're popular, boys. And, and Patrick. Hey, Patrick. What's Good up, evening. Patrick? Got Patrick chiming in. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so anyways, Arizona. Landscape. Marvelous. Absolutely beautiful to behold. Scorching deserts. Plunging canyons. Forest-covered mountains. All of which bear stories stretching back centuries. The history and culture of this land is just as varied, with people coming from near and far to seek out their fortunes, some adventure, or perhaps a little solitude. Whatever has drawn people here in life may still do so in death, as the spirits of Arizona linger, just waiting for their tales to be told. Plus they have vortexes. Yes, plus they avoid taxes. No, no, they have vortexes. Vortex. Circular vortex. Or energy vortex. Vortex. Okay. I have no idea what their tax situation is. No. You lived there. You would know better than me. No. Vortex. Vortex. Okay, but now the tax is... <laughs> yeah, no, we're not going down that <laughs> That tangent yeah, okay. stays closed. All right. We're going to start our evening with a stop in Flagstaff, which is in north-central Arizona. It's a relative newcomer to the Arizona landscape. Flagstaff was settled in the late 1800s as lumberjacks, railroads, and outlaws flocked to this corner of the state. Their arrival set the stage for colorful tales and dark hauntings that will be spoken of for generations to come, bringing us to our first stop, the Hotel Monte Vista. Standing above the corner of Aspen and San Francisco streets, the Hotel Monte Vista stands just off Historic Route 66 as a notable landmark in the heart of historic Flagstaff. With nearby mountains and canyons, the Hotel Monte Vista is an ideal, ideal place to relax while exploring the natural wonders that northern Arizona has to offer. When tourism was on the rise in the mid-1920s, Flagstaff residents realized that they were behind the curve in greeting visitors to their city. The existing hotels were old and outdated, and the need for something new was abundantly clear. Fundraising began in April 1926, and within one month, investments of prominent citizens in funds donated by novelist Zane Gray totaled approximately $200,000. I love that name, yeah. Zane Gray. Yeah. Oh, no, he's Colonel Potter's favorite. <laughs> I don't know, but, he, I just, uh, like, <laughs> but I, I just love the name. I got to shoehorn Nash in. <laughs> so, but this was enough money, $200,000 was enough money for them to break ground on a state-of-the-art hotel. I wish two hundred thousand dollars would. This would be a state of the heart hotel. Uh, yeah, <laughs> almost, it should be almost two. Uh, but in addition to the seventy-three room hotel, the structure would also hold a local post office, the Monte uh, Vista Cocktail Lounge, uh, and the Co- uh, Copanino Sun newspaper offices. The new hotel opened for business on New Year's Day, nineteen twenty-seven originally named the Community Hotel in honor of the townspeople who contributed to its existence. The name Monte Vista, meaning Mountain View, was chosen by a 12-year-old con- contest winter. 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 The Monte Vista continued to be the longest publicly held commercial property in Arizona until it was sold to a private investor in the early 1960s. It continues to be one of the oldest hotels in Flagstaff and is listed on the U.S. Registrar of Historic Places. Amongst the interesting tidbits associated with the hotel is its role as a speakeasy during Prohibition. This ill-guided constitutional amendment was already well in place when the hotel opened, but this gave the builders of the hotel an excellent opportunity to build a cover for the bootlegging and speakeasy operation that would take place here. 
The Cocktail Lounge opened under the guise of a new newspaper publishing house and operated successfully until the authorities caught wind of what was going on in 1931. The operation was shut down but reopened legally with the repeal of Prohibition in 1933. Then there are the underground tunnels that connect the Monte Vista Hotel with numerous other locations across Flagstaff. These tunnels were already in existence when the hotel was built, having been excavated by Chinese immigrants in the early 1900s. The tunnels start down by Northern Arizona University and wind up across downtown. The immigrants built the tunnels in response to persecution that they were subjected to in the wake of a fire that was blamed on their cooking practices. The tunnels allowed the immigrants to move about the community without harassment, though the existence of the tunnels drove further suspicion and resentment as they became, uh, as they became known as a refuge for illicit distilleries, opium dens, and gambling houses. Today, what remains of the tunnels is mostly used to run utilities and for storage by attached businesses, including the Monte Vista Hotel. On a less mysterious note, the fame and comfort of the Hotel Monte Vista has drawn many of Hollywood's elite for generations, including Jane Russell, Gary Cooper, Spencer Tracy, John Wayne, and Bing Crosby, many of whom were here to film westerns in the 1940s and 50s. The hotel has also been used as a backdrop for some notable movies, including Casablanca and Forrest Gump. Cat trade. With so much going on and such a colorful history, it should come as no surprise that the Hotel, hotel Monte Vista has always been known for rumors of the hauntings. As a matter of fact, the hotel embraces this aspect of their heritage. You're welcome to chat with the staff about any of the stories that they may have to share. Until you can visit there, though, we've got a sampling for what you might expect at this haunted establishment. In the early 1980s, room 220 was inhabited by a long-term boarder with a very bizarre and unsettling habit. For reasons unknown, he would hang raw meat from the chandelier in his room. Despite this unusual tendency, he was allowed to stay on in the room until his eventual death. When it, he was found, it was estimated he had passed away three days prior. Not long after the sporter's death, a maintenance worker was working on a few repairs. When in need of a new fixture, he left the room, turned off the lights, and locked the door. Returning only a few minutes later, he unlocked the door and entered the room to find the television at full volume, the bed linen shredded and scattered around the room, and today, well, it's common for the television in that room to turn on on its own accord, and guests will sometimes report feeling a cold, man's cold hands touching them in their sleep. <laughs> Somebody else wanted to be touched, Hi. sorry. <laughs> Moving on over to room 305, we find the space that many people believe to have the most paranormal activity in the hotel. Many people have seen a ghostly woman in the rocking chair near the window, or have even seen the chair move on its own. There have been reports of knocking sounds and, ow! Not biting, knocking. Rude, sir. <laughs> anyway, knocking sounds inside the closet, which is always empty when the space is investigated. Records show that the room was used by an elderly woman who was a long-term boarder at the Hotel Monte Vista. She would sit in a chair by the window for hours on end and had a habit that she seemed to be carrying on after her passing. Moving, of course, to the adjacent room, 306, we have a story that dates to the days of when Flagstaff's red light district could be found just a couple of blocks away from the hotel. In the early 1940s, two ladies of the night were brought to room 306 for what they thought would be a typical trick. Unfortunately, during their visit to room 306, they were killed and thrown from the third floor window to the street below. Over the years, guests have reported been wakened in the middle of the night and unable to return to sleep due to a feeling that they're being watched. Many of the male guests endure the feeling of having hands placed over their mouths and throats and awakening unable to breathe. So yeah, you don't want that room, Patrick. The spirits are not limited to one-time visitors or guests of the hotel, since some of the spirited staff members seem to linger on as well. Hotel guests have reported a knock at their door and a muffled voice announcing room service. Oftentimes, when guests open the door, they find the hallway empty, but some guests have opened the doors to find a young bellboy standing outside room 210. Even John Wayne encountered this entity during some of his stays at the hotel, but he noted that the presence felt friendly, unthreatening. 
Living staff members have sometimes seen him as well, noting his old-fashioned red coat with shiny brass buttons. Another lingering staff member has been encountered around the elevators. The Hotel Monte Vista was home to one of the first self-service Otis elevators in the state of Arizona. And even though it has been modernized since then, it's as if the elevator attendant is still on their shift. Guests often hear a voice asking, which floor? The staff members have witnessed a phantom hand closing the elevator gate. Most chilling of all have been the reflections of a man in the elevator mirror when they are most certainly quite alone. Been there, done that. <laughs> in the cocktail lounge, several spirits seem to carry on here, making it a popular Halloween spot amongst Flagstaff's residents. People see, have seen a phantom couple dancing in the lounge, decked out in their beautiful former clothes. Uh, smiling, laughing, eternally joking themselves, and enjoying themselves. Aside from the dancers, people have also seen bar stools and drinks moving on their own. While uncertain, this activity has been attributed to a man who died in the cocktail lounge in the 1970s. He was uh, one of three bank robbers who knocked over a nearby knocked over a nearby bank, but was unable to make a clean escape and was shot by one of the guards. Instead of seeking help for his wound, the trio went to the cocktail lounge to celebrate their heist and enjoy a drink. The wounded man bled out while enjoying a final beverage. It was after that day that the bar stools and the drinks started to move on their own volition. So if a spooky trip to Flagstaff is on your to-do list, there's no better place to stay than the Hotel Monte Vista. Well, and while you're there, you might as well check out this next little spot. Yes. So just a 30-minute walk from the Hotel Monte Vista, still in the heart of Flagstaff, is Rotorin Mansion State Historic Park. This 13,000 square foot mansion was built in 1904, but its story starts in the 1880s with the arrival of Irish immigrant brothers Timothy and Michael Rotorin in Flagstaff. The brothers were managers for the Arizona Lumber and Timber Company, and their work made them very wealthy. Much of this wealth was turned to the benefit of the community as they advocated for educational facilities such as the Normal School, which grew into Northern Arizona University. Mm -hmm. They also recruited the Lowell Observatory and the Fort Valley Experimental Forest Station to set up in Flagstaff, institutions that remain prominent in Flagstaff today. Their wealth and prominence also helped them land their wives, Carolyn and Elizabeth, the Metz sisters. Yes, the brothers married sisters. So. More common than you think. Yep. So, and the tight-knit families built the Red Ren Mansion together, and each couple lived in one wing of the 40-room mansion. That's really kind of close. But anyways, this arrangement carried on for decades, until 1943, when Carolyn passed away. As legend goes, the Red Rens always kept a light burning in the chapel at their home. The light was maintained by the house staff, and while the Redorans were traveling, one of uh, were traveling, one of the housekeepers needed to replace the lamp. Unfortunately, the housekeeper returned shortly thereafter to find that the lamp had burned out again. It was shortly thereafter that they received word that Carolyn had passed away. The lamp had failed at the moment of her passing. Carolyn's spirit seems to have returned to her beloved home, as her presence has been felt and seen at the home ever since. She is seen caring for her young daughter, Anna, who herself passed away at a young age from polio. Moving objects and items dropping off of shelves have been attributed to Carolyn over the years, as many people think that she continues to go on about her business in the place that she called home for so many years. So, kind of a really, it's an interesting place. Uh, it was, uh, um, you know, this family home for so many years. Uh, when the Redrens did eventually move out, um, another uh, individual, you know, kind of snapped it up, but then uh, it wasn't long, I think it was in the 1960s, that the estate got donated to the state and winds up becoming the state historic site. Yeah. So, yeah, really kind of a neat place. Um, if you get there, you can go ahead and check it out. But with that, yeah. well, there's certainly much more that we could talk about in Flagstaff. Oh, there, yeah, there's a lot more. There's a lot more, but we do have a lot to ground to cover tonight, and if you do notice anything glaring that is missing from the episode, we, besides tombstone, besides tombstone, <laughs> we do uh, we do already have a uh, Arizona Part Two script started that we will share sometime in the future. We got a lot of material to cover, but uh, yeah. we'll get around to I it. I got a lot point. of Part Twos. Yeah, 
And uh, again, yeah, I mean, this is not our first visit to Arizona as well. We've had a couple of other stories, as we already discussed, popping in on Arizona. So for tonight, though, <clears throat> we're going to move along from Flagstaff, and we're going to go a little to the south to the mountains of central Arizona, uh, where we can find the historic mining town of Jerome. Even though the community's copper mining days are long past, people still come here to enjoy the scenery, the history, the art galleries, and the wineries that keep the area thriving. Those who are rolling in for a stay may find themselves at the historic Connor Hotel. Built in 1898 by David Connor, the Connor Hotel has a colorful past, ranging from the heights of luxury to the depths of squalor and back again. Originally designed with 20 rooms upstairs, this first-class lodging establishment also offered a bar room, card rooms, and billiard tables on the first floor. This establishment was on the cutting edge of luxury and amenities at the time of its construction, so much so that its original telephone number was 8. Just 8. Nice. Dial 8 for the Connor Hotel. That said, before the turn of the century, David Connor's hotel had burned to the ground twice along with many other fine buildings in Jerome's crowded downtown. David Connor was fortunate in that he was one of only two business owners in the town to carry insurance, in the handsome amount of $14,500. As a result, he was immediately able to rebuild the hotel, unlike many other buildings lost to the fires that swept Jerome before the turn of the century. After it reopened in August of 1899, it enjoyed the distinction of being one of the finest lodging establishments in the booming mining towns of the West. The hotel had its own bus for delivering guests to the train depot and was fully booked much of the time. Though the hotel was too expensive for the ladies of the night to use, their uh, to use for their customers, there was a false storefront located at the west end of the building which opened to the infamous Husband's Alley where the ladies had their own cribs to entertain customers on the street just below Main Street. I love the Husband's Alley. It's just like the Husband's Walk and Catch you Can. Yep. So we will uh, touch on this again in just a little bit. But before we get back to that, um, time did go on, and the fortunes of the mines did eventually wane. And so waned the fortunes of the Connor Hotel. In 1931, the hotel closed. David Connor's son and heir continued to rent out the shops downstairs, but the rooms sat idle upstairs. Through the ensuing decades, various merchants renting space in the Connor eked a living out of the dwindling residence remaining in Jerome. When the mines closed in the 1950s, the town came close to becoming a ghost town. The remaining merchants shifted gear to try and make a living from the scant tourist traffic wending its way through the formerly, formerly bustling town. In the 1960s and 70s, Jerome was discovered by the hippies. Hmm. Hippies to the rescue. They opened artesian shops, selling everything from candles to pottery to stained glass. The growing art scene drew in more people, and the town of Jerome was saved, along with the Connor Hotel. The Connor Hotel was a far cry from its previous luxury. This time it was a basic, low-budget flop house of sorts, which is quite popular, especially with people having a night on the town. While not glamorous, it was the place to be in Jerome. The bar room was made bigger by incorporating the lobby of the hotel into the bar itself. Through the years, the bar room transformed into a smoke shop, a restaurant, a freight office, and then was turned back into a bar. It is currently called the Spirit Room. Unresolved safety issues dictated that the hotel closes doors again in the 1980s. Lacking a sprinkler system and a fire escape will do that. In 2000, new ownership took on the challenge of renovating the hotel, bringing it up to current safety standards, and renovating the rooms to their original splendor, plus some other modern perks of that people expect today. While Jerome narrowly avoided becoming one of the West Ghost Towns, it has latched onto a legacy of hosting ghosts. The town's checkered past is ripe with material to give it a spooky reputation, including some haunts at the Connor Hotel. Directly above the hotel's spirit uh, room bar is room number one, in which the lady in red has decided to make her permanent residence. Some think that she's the spirit of Anna Hopkins, the wife of a local miner company's chief engineer. Anna believed her husband was in some kind of relationship with a local school teacher, Miss Marie Gallagher, and she decided to enact revenge herself. 
1922, Hawkins threw a carbolic acid into the face of Miss Marie in the downstairs cafe of the Connor Hotel. The stories are a little hazy as to what happened to the teacher. Some say she survived her injuries and relocated to Spokane, where later she died. Other stories state that the teacher suffered a very painful death a few weeks later as a result of her injuries. What we do know, however, is that a few months later, Anna Hopkins was convicted of assault for the incident and was sentenced to six years in prison. After her release, she returned to Jerome, living for a time in the Connor Hotel Room Number 1. Guests in Room Number 1 will hear a woman whispering in the room, sometimes accompanied by an unsettling scratching noise. Others have awakened in the middle of the night to a feeling of cold, almost suffocating weight on top of them, almost as if someone is trying to hold them down in bed. This was too much for one man who fled from the room and stayed by, stayed the balance of the night in his van. The lady in red got her name for, after appearing to a number of unsuspecting visitors in the spirit bar, witnessed her make one of many visits to the space below the room where she resides. Even if you don't have the opportunity to see into the spirit yourself, you can, of course, see a painting of her. An artist who stayed in the room kept seeing the lady in red in his dreams. He painted the large mural found above the bar in the spirit room, including his vision of the lady of red. The lady in red is far from alone in the Connor Hotel. Guests throughout the establishment have been subjected to a wide variety of odd activity, including disembodied voices, unexplained malfunctioning in electronics, Odd streaks of portal-like images showing up on camera, and much, much more. So, well, if you decide to go to this hotel, pack your gear. Maybe you get some cool things. I just realized why I know the name Jerome. Mm -hmm. What's first, that? first reason that I know the name Jerome. My little sister calls me one day while well, she's in Arizona visiting my aunt. She says, "I went to the most boring town today." <laughs> secondly so she's not into the hippie art thing she didn't love it um, <laughs> secondly I hate this Zach Vegas oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. he's been a couple of times oh yes yeah. and I think he's been to that hotel we, we're yes he has yeah, we, we, uh, we skipped that part we, we, <laughs> we did not we skipped that part but yes he's He's actually been to a couple of the locations that we're going to be talking about tonight. I mean, naturally, from what I understand, it's a very boring town. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. So, but, uh, but yeah. So it, it, we're, we're, we're going to go on to Husband Alley now. Yeah, so we mentioned husband, Husband's Alley. And mm -hmm. uh, this is, you know, immediately Jason's the Connor Hotel. Now, is, was... Was. was. It's not really a thing anymore. But in any case, at one point in time, Ladies of the Night could be found throughout Jerome. When brothels were located right next to saloons and women could walk through the town to advertise their business. Eventually, these ladies and their trade were relegated to the back streets in out of sight, out of mind places that came to be known by thinly veiled names such as Husband's Alley. Such work in towns like Jerome operated on a hierarchical Hierarchy. Hierarchical scale. Hierarchical scale. Big words. <laughs> Lots of syllables. <laughs> You're off He's girl. halfway through his drink. <laughs> yes, I am. Because I'm so proud. Uh, anyways, it's better than last week. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. At the high end of the scale were classy ladies who worked in brothels operated by madams who had a relatively cushy job. They often only provided expensive companionship for lonely men living in a town almost devoid of women, and had access to health care, security, and education. At the low end of the scale were women working in the cribs, who somehow managed to see 30 to 80 clients a day. It was an immensely difficult job that had no guarantees of safety, and many women who worked in the industry succumbed to the illnesses or violence associated with the job. There were many stories about the horrors that these sex workers endured, and history just barely remembers a few who died at the hands of their clients. One case was that of Sammy Dean, whose spirit you'll find wandering Husband's Alley. Sam, Sammy Dean was born in 1892 and found herself working in the brothels of Jerome at some point in the late 1920s. 
On the evening of July 10, 1931, after multiple people searched for her, they found Sammy lying on her bed, strangled to death. The murderer was thought to have been a client of hers or a boyfriend, but no one was ever questioned or charged with her murder. Years after her death, reports began to come in of the sight of a beautiful woman wandering around Husband's Alley looking for something or someone. Many believe this is Sammy Dean looking for her killer alone in the streets where she once worked. While Sammy is just one of many such women, she is just one of the few that is remembered by name. Alright, so I'm going to move over to the Jerome Grand Hotel. Um, it's a quarter of a mile away on top of Cleopatra Hill, and uh, it's an imposing five-story Spanish Mission-style structure. The Jerome Grand Hotel was originally built as the United Verde Hospital in 1927. Almost a century on, this structure remains an engineering marvel, as it's a massive concrete bulk that sits well embedded in the mountain's side at a 50-degree angle slope. The United Verde Hospital was a state-of-the-art modern hospital at the time of its opening. It's considered to be the most modern and well-equipped hospital in Arizona and possibly the western United States. It was built to be fireproof and sturdy to withstand dynamite blasts up to 260,000 pounds from the mines nearby. When it closed in 1950 because of a dwindling mine activity, it was kept up to snuff as a hospital just in case it was needed as an emergency. Eventually the time came when it was clear that the old hospital would not be needed again. Other medical center centers had popped up in nearby communities and the United Verte Hospital was unneeded and obsolete. As Jerome eventually became a to be a thriving tourist destination, it was determined that the massive building on the hill had potential for other purposes. And in 1994, the building was bought by the Phelps Dodge Mining Company by the Al Althier family. After extensive renovations, the Jerome Grand Hotel opened its doors in 1996. Because it was taken care of for so many years and built to last, after the renovation, it can be said that the hotel is the best preserved building in Arizona. The upper floors of the uh, house the guest rooms, and the bottom floors of the uh, house the lobby, the gift shop, a high-end restaurant, and the hotel kitchen. Walking into the lobby is like walking into the 1920s era. The charming 1926 Otis elevator, which serves all five floors, is a, the oldest original self-service elevator in Arizona. And the atmosphere might inspire you to go digging into the closet for that old flapper or dapper pinstripe suit. It's a kind of place where the has a certain spirit of its own. The building has long had a spooky reputation with ghost stories dating back to the hospital days. Patients, staff, and visitors alike would hear talking, coughing, hard breathing, moaning, cries of distress from pain on every floor which come not from the living but from people who are no longer there in bodily form. This activity is carried through to, into the hotel, hotel era with guests and staff still reporting the chilling sensations. In addition to these sounds, people will still sometimes hear old hospital gurneys rolling on wooden floors even though the old floorboards have long since been replaced with noise-dampening carpets. Beyond the noises, a variety of apparitions appear throughout the hotel as well. There's the bearded apparition, most likely a miner who has lingered about the building for many a year. He's a rather friendly fellow who likes to pop in on the living. Many years ago, a night duty nurse had just taken off the call lights and returned downstairs. Much to her annoyance, all the lights went on again. Thinking it was a lone patient on this ward, she went upstairs to scold the man, uh, but she found him in bed where he was supposed to be. The patient told the nurse that he saw a bearded man glide down the hall, turning on all the lights. Another occurrence, a nurse was about to leave the floor when she saw a bearded man out of the bed, excuse me, where she saw a bearded man out of the bed standing at the very end of the hall. Thinking that it was a patient where they didn't belong, she quickly approached him, and he abruptly disappeared. Guests at the hotel have also seen the bearded man, especially on the second and third floors. On the fourth floor, that's where the maternity ward once was, there's a ghost of a mother who lost her baby in childbirth. She roams the halls, frantically searching for her baby. 
In the area where the expectant fathers could wait for news about their wives and children, a sense of cigar smoke and whiskey can still be smelled permeating the air. Many other inexplicable encounters still occur throughout the hotel, to guests and staff alike. Switching, turning on, turning off, the doors opening and closing, cold gusts of air running down hallways, chairs moving about on their own, objects flying off the shelves, voices calling out to a staff member's name, and they're, of course, quite alone when this happens, other distinct apparitions, and much, much more. We'll wrap up the old Grand Hotel with one last spooky offering, this one surrounding the charming elevator we mentioned earlier. In 1936, a hospital's fireman engineer, Claude M. Harvey, well known by everybody in town as Scotty, was found dead in the basement. The elevator had pinned him to the ground, crushing his head. The elevator was in perfect working order. Scotty wasn't suicidal, which leaves the possibility that Scotty was murdered. Unfortunately, no evidence was available to build a case against anyone, although there were several theories and suspects. Some say that Claude was not content to let anybody get away with his murder, leading him to haunt the building to this day. Several manifestations have been attributed to him. Mysterious lights have been seen in the elevator shaft. The sound of creaking iron elevator has long been heard throughout the basement, on the stairs, and in other parts of the hotel, often with an angry demeanor though he has never threatened to hurt or hurt anyone. Employees sitting at the lobby desk have felt an angry glare from a presence on the stairs. The feeling becomes so strong that they look up and they see a shadowy figure, after which it retreats up the stairs. While it's unlikely that Claude will ever receive the satisfaction he desires, maybe he can someday find a safe way to take comfort in the cozy surroundings of the modern hotel, just as many of the, as the living do today. It really is kind of a, it's a fascinating place, mm -hmm. perched up there on the mountainside yeah. like it is. Buddy, I'm sorry, I've got to move my foot. <laughs> it's tingly. So, oh. before we stray too far from the subject of the United Verde Hospital, let's note that the hospital was built to support the activities of the United Verde Mines that formed the economic backbone of the community for many decades. The jobs provided by these mines were both lucrative and extremely dangerous. While death rarely occurred inside the mine, it wasn't uncommon for miners to die from injuries sustained during the job. These usually occur on jobs associated with explosions, but any injury that involved something like, like amputation would probably result in death a few months later after, after infections invaded the body. That said, men did die in the mines, and for many of them, when this happened, it sometimes became their final resting place. There are dozens of old mine shafts and tunnels which are thought to be the final resting place of these miners crisscrossing the city of Jerome. According to residents, some of these miners still haunt their old workplace, including the spirit of Headless Charlie. As the name would suggest, Headless Charlie was decapitated in an accident years ago. His head was recovered, but the rest of him was never found. After his death, many other miners would report hearing groaning and random shuffling, as if the ghost of Charlie was looking for his bits and pieces that were never recovered. So. Bits and pieces. That's a big bit and piece of news. That's a lot of bits and pieces. Didn't say that all the bits and pieces would be in one place. That just say. Anyways. We will move on from Jerome. Prescott! We're going to go to Prescott. Yep. A little to the east, city of Prescott. Uh, in the heart of the city's historic district, we can find the Palace Restaurant and Saloon. Good chance you've probably heard of this place. It's been featured on quite a few shows. The Palace Restaurant and Saloon was built soon after the town of Prescott began to build structures for its downtown area in 1877. What was needed was an upscale saloon that was decorated tastefully and lavishly. It became the most popular watering hole for all classes of folks in Prescott. Miners who came to town to relax and spend their earnings enjoyed the beer, the gaming opportunities at the tables, a good meal, and a roll in the hay with a pretty lady of the night. In the 1870s, Wyatt Earp, Virgil Earp, and Doc Holliday came to drink at the Palace Saloon while they rested in Prescott before making the journey to Tombstone. There's your mention of Tombstone for the evening. <laughs> <laughs> 
Wyatt and Holiday saw some action in Prescott, a precursor to what they would experience in Tombstone, such as at the OK Corral. Wyatt Earp was involved in several gunfight fights behind the saloon, killing two men. Holiday also killed a man in the saloon during a knife fight. Of course, it was a rough era, era in a rough part of town before strong lawmen had control of the rowdies. Disaster hit in 1883 when a raging fire burned down the saloon. Not to be defeated, the owner, Robert Brow, built a grander version of the Palace Saloon in a smarter way to deter fires. This grander, new saloon had a stone foundation as well as brick walls to help prevent another burndown. What was added was a magnificent hand-carved oak or solid oak and cherry wood bar that was a glorious piece of furniture and a magnificent addition. The Palace Saloon became even more admired and loved by the drinking community. In the basement, there were dens for those who enjoyed smoking opium. The basement was connected to tunnels that ran under the street. These contributed to illegal vices banned above ground. Eventually, prostitution was outlawed and mining ceased. But the people who ran the Palace Saloon found that tourists and vacationers made up for the financial slack. Tourism dollars supplanted the financial support the businesses received from the locals, or supplemented the financial support the businesses received from the locals who still loved the place. During Prohibition, the traditional bar on the first floor stopped serving alcohol, but people could still get a meal. A speakeasy was set up in the basement for people who wanted their beer and to gamble in a card game. Through numerous challenges, the Palace Saloon and Restaurant has soldiered on through the years to the present day, and along the way it has picked up a fair number of spirits. First we have Mr. Nevins. This spirit is still frustrated and angry at himself for losing his business in a card game. When people play cards, his unseen presence is drawn to the table, wanting to win back his mortuary, even though he can't participate in the game today. Some think that his bitterness makes him the spirit who throws glasses around. There is an 1890 photograph of the saloon area that appears to capture the ghost of a man standing near the gambling tables, believed to be Mr. Nevis. Then we have the lady, or ladies, known as Jenny and or Alice. It's a little fuzzy on this point. They have been seen both at the top of the stairs and floating through the first floor of the saloon. Much like Mr. Nevis, they are also very unhappy with their fates. Jenny was murdered, and Alice's fate was arguably worse. I'll kind of leave it at that. They have been blamed for objects that have been uh, that have fallen from the balcony, including a porcelain mannequin that would have put an awful hurt on someone if it had fallen on their head. They have also been looked to as the cause for messing up the buffet area, as if they are protesting people enjoying a meal where they suffered grim fates. The spirits at the palace maintain their mean streak with Fred Glover. He is believed to be the one responsible for the murder of the previously mentioned Jenny, but he never faced true justice for the crime. He was convicted, but instead of meeting at the end of a hangman's noose, he was released from prison after only five years. His activity has included pushing a plant from the top of the bar, nearly striking the owner, who was standing nearby. Before noting the next spirit, we should mention that these spirits and their associated activity, throwing certain things, pushing certain things over, this can all come across as very similar. Who do we know who did what? What has drawn the line between many of them uh, and many of the spirits and the paranormal activities is that a lot of paranormal investigations have been hosted at the Pell Saloon. It is renowned as one of the most haunted places in Arizona and is a major draw for investigative teams from near and far. And most of this information comes from evidence that they've gathered during these investigations, um, you know, electronic voice phenomena, all kinds of evidence that's come forth that has linked certain spirits to certain activities. So, that's that, how they sorted out. Yeah. That said, we will note that this next spirit is much more on the pleasant side. Master Pastor is a happy presence who likes to make his presence known. He will frequently make himself known to the living on audio recordings, and he likes to stomp his cowboy boots and walk around the saloon. He seems particularly fond of the bar, leading some to think that he may be spiritually attached to the bar itself. One final spirit that we'll mention here is the entity in the basement. 
The negative energy in the basement of the Palace Saloon has been a menace for many years. It seems to enjoy instilling terror in the living and subjecting them to significant physical pain, making the basement a place where the living usually only spend a few minutes at a time. Fortunately, it seems to be unable to actually kill anyone. Some think that it's the spirit of a murderer, while others look to more demonic causes. Regardless of the cause, the basement is now a far cry from the bustling spot that it was in the speakeasy and opium den days, a spot that is generally only used for storage and is avoided by the living unless absolutely necessary. Sorry, I've got the case of the yawns right now. <laughs> It's been a day. It's been a long day. It's been a long day. I got a lot of sun today, and that always wipes me out. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to move over to Tucson. Uh, this is in South Central Arizona, and here we got Little Abner Steakhouse, a roomy 5,800 square foot L shaped brick building, along with the main drag, oh, excuse me, along the main drag that connects Tucson to suburbia. It's a convenient location and encourages people to stop in for takeout on the way home. But it also draws in a fair number of barbecue lovers to dine inside. It's hard to believe that this modern restaurant uh, resides in what was once a Butterfield Express stage stop in the 1880s. When the trains replaced the stagecoaches, it became a cattle station. As 1947, it became Little Abner's when local obstetrician Larry Lewis and his wife Duchess renovated the building and opened the saloon, which was named after their dog. It was a perfect place for a saloon and an eyeglass store where he used prescriptions supplied by the ophthalmologist and our, or optometrist to make glasses for customers. In the years since, a series of owners have made gradual changes to Little Abner's, adding their own touches to the barbecue joint. Big things like more grills, more eating space, expanding the menu, and adding performance stages. The small things, like the western memorabilia that decorates the original wood walls, old license plates, graffiti, and paintings. The current owners uh, came into possession of Little Abner's. Well, let's just say it's a wee bit of a funny story. In 1965, local businessman Don Norum, uh, Norman excuse me, purchased the restaurant. His twin sons, Mike and Mark, proved to be a handful while growing up, and they decided to go for easy money in the early 70s. They flew small planes full of smuggled drugs and marijuana to town. And then they sold out of the restaurant. Mark was convicted for his transgressions and sent to federal uh, penitentiary in 1975. They didn't learn their lesson after Mike was released in 17, uh, excuse me, 1978. Uh, the brothers began counterfeiting. They were both caught in 1979 when the FBI raided their stash of phony bills buried behind the restaurant. The restaurant had been sold in 1981 to pay the huge legal bills acquired by the miscreants. The family defense attorney, David Hoffman, fell in love with this special place and bought it after reviewing the restaurant's books. He quit his law practice, and he and his wife, Molly, began operating the restaurant and bar. I love that the the, <laughs> the owner's lawyer is like, y'all are just idiots. I'll do what I can to keep you out of jail, but I'm taking your bar. <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite. <laughs> um, so in 2015, uh, they hoped to sell their beloved business, but it took off, uh, was taken off the market when Sun Tucker showed an interest in running it. As of 2022, the restaurant is still going strong, and the Hoffman family is still the owner. All that said, it's an interesting spot in Tucson with a couple of spirits to go with their menu full of tasty options. One seems determined to make the most of being spirit here, and one is on a mission that they felt compelled to accomplish before they could rest. When Larry Lewis had his opt opt opticians. opticians office in the area that is now the kitchen, someone misplaced a customer's glasses, causing great annoyance for all concerned especially the person in charge of managing the eyeglasses. The glasses were replaced to the satisfaction of the customer, but the person who lost them could not forgive themselves, even in the afterlife. It's In the years that followed, it seems that an entity will rifle through the cupboards, making a mess out of the things while they search for the glasses that can never be found. We hope that the spirit will eventually get the hint that the glasses were long lost in the space when the space became a kitchen. The spectral tale reminds, uh, remains a fixture of the fabric of Little Abner's history. 
Then there's the more contented spirit who is seen frequenting the bar. He dresses in white. White at a barbecue place? No, no. No, no. This is this is not a napkin. <laughs> anyway, I digress. <laughs> he likes to sit at the bar looking like a living person. Visitors and employees who sit there think he is real. And then he suddenly vanishes before their eyes. At the bar, he's seen drinking milk or a large Coke. He seems to like Captain Crunch cereal, and he's frequently crunching away on a bowl of the stuff. They'll see him and hear him crunching away on Captain Crunch. And is, I love that detail. A ghost that sits there eating Captain Crunch. Kind of reminds me of Big Julian from Guys and Dolls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess yeah. we know where he went. Yeah. I, I personally was never a real big fan of Captain Crunch, but... Kudos to this gentleman. Yeah. Eating eating Captain Crunch at the bar in the afterlife. There's yeah. there's worst face worst fates. He yeah. likes to say hello <laughs> by startling people in a fun way. Employees working near the bar have heard a disembodied voice calling out their names. After hearing something move behind the bar, a patron was enjoying her meal, and she suddenly screamed after seeing the spirit, a huge one of a veteran waitress from behind. Owners think that this is the lingering spirit of a former maintenance man named George. Uh, even though he's passed, it's nice to know he seems to be content with hanging out in his former haunt in the afterlife. And hey, if he fixes a few things as well. Hey, ghosts that... Uh, ghosts that clean and do maintenance, does I'm maintenance, okay with that. As an absolute, like, hall pass. You can do what you want. Yeah. You, if you, as if, long as you don't burn the place down. Yeah. If you're fixing the place and not trashing the place, you are more than welcome. We have a kitchen sink that we have a kitchen sink that could hint hint. Anyways, <laughs> one last where you're going there. <laughs> one last stop for this evening. We are going to Phoenix, as we noted at the beginning of the show. I was a bad person. No, you weren't a bad person. I was a bad author. How about that? I'm not even going to say bad that. Bad researcher. Bad researcher. I, okay, no, no. You work hard on this. I'm not going to criticize. It's just, I, I noticed it felt like when I was reading through this, a glaring omission that we didn't have a single story from the largest city in the state. It's also the only other city in the state that I know other than Houston. Yeah, well, bear with us just a second. We're about to have the... Uh... Oh, nope, they turned a different direction. Our friendly uh, our, our friendly neighbors at the fire department were, making a, call. were <laughs> making a little noise outside. I heard our friendly, and I'm like... No, our, fr right our friendly neighbors. <laughs> friendly. Neighbors. Friendly. Anyways. There was a big pause there. So, we are going to go... Uh, uh, to the Orpheum Theater. Now, if you've heard of Orpheum Theater before, you need to make sure we're talking about the right one because there's actually there's a, lot of, there's a there. lot of them all across the country. They were kind of sort of somewhat a chain. That's not something I'm going to get into here in detail, but let's just say that if you've heard of Orpheum Theater before, you may have heard of it in a different city. Quite possible. So anyways, the one in Phoenix opens its doors January 5th, 1929. And it was at the leading edge of entertainment. It was a prime vaudeville performance venue. And it also brought the new talkie films to the Phoenix, uh, Phoenix community. In the years that followed, the Orpheum would change with an evolving community, new owners, and new forms of entertainment. It did a stint as the Paramount after being purchased by Paramount Pictures in the 1940s. In the 1960s, it was purchased by the Nederlander organization to add to their portfolio of venues that would feature traveling Broadway shows, and was renamed Palace West. From the mid-1970s through the early 1980s, it was leased to the Corona family, who used it as a place to highlight Hispanic events in movies. Unfortunately for the aging theater, at this point, maintenance was a low priority, and it started to fall into a state of disrepair. In 1984, the city of Phoenix stepped in, purchased the theater, and began an ambitious restoration campaign that lasted 12, 13 years. It's 1997 now, and the Orpheum Theater was back. 
Uh, stepping into the theater is like stepping back in time. The atmosphere and fixtures are much like they were when the Orpheum first opened in 1929. The lobby is dominated by ornate details that are carved into the doors, walls, and ceilings, all bathed in the warm glow of the chandeliers. Ever since its reopening, the theater has served as the official home of the Phoenix Opera and has also hosted a variety of concerts, Broadway shows, and many other special events. With such a varied history and such a beautiful atmosphere, the theater was bound to have some guests and performers who would never want to leave. The theater's most famous and prominent spirit is known as Maddie. This little girl spends most of her time on the balcony, and she does not tolerate people who might be inclined to talk through a performance. She is frequently seen by visitors and has been known to tap people on the shoulder and to shush them if they get a little too chatty while in her space. She has also given a terrible fright to some of the performers who grace the stage. In one instance, less than ten years ago, a group of acrobats were in the midst of their performance, and on five different occasions during the performance, five different acrobats stopped in the middle of their act, pointed to the balcony, and screamed. What each of them had seen was a woman standing on the edge of the balcony and then abruptly stepping off. The acrobats thought that the woman was about to plunge into the seats below, but as soon as she stepped away from the balcony, she abruptly disappeared. The identity of Maddie isn't known, but the theory is that her behavior reminded someone of a friend or relative named Maddie, and that the name just stuck. There otherwise is no record of a Maddie or an individual with a similar kind of name in relation to the history of the Orpheum. Other specters at the theater include a man that lingers about the manager's office, right above the theater's marquee sign. Many think that this is Harry Nance. Many of the found, or one of the founders of the Orpheum Theater who put a lot of personal passion into the landmark and into the community as well. Nance would pass away under mysterious circumstances in 1953 in what was officially ruled a suicide in his apartment just a couple miles to the north of the Orpheum Theater. While no one has come face to face with the specter to determine if it is indeed Mr. Nance, people like to think that he is the one responsible for the fig figure of a short stature that is seen through the one-time office window from the street. Having only been five foot two inches tall, Mr. Nance was known for having a personality much larger than his height. They also think that it is his footsteps that pace around the area where his office once was. All of this is made that much more remarkable by the fact that the office no longer exists in form or function. The space was opened up as a part of the renovation, and there is no longer a floor to be trod upon by anyone. We'll note one other spirit that is said to linger about the theater, one of the feline persuasion. This spirit cat is often heard purring by guests and staff members alike. Perhaps the theater kept a mouser about the, uh, kept a thesis. Perhaps the theater kept a mouser about back in the day. One that is still very much on the job, perhaps? Not this one. No. This not. one's out cold. Yeah. <laughs> now, one, fi uh, well, uh, let's see, one final fun fact about the Orpheum Theater. As with just about every theater, there are superstitions and rituals that must be followed, lest a curse fall upon the productions that take place there. In the case of the Orpheum Theater, there is a collection of rubber duckies backstage that are not to be disturbed. Even if you're not the superstitious type, do you want to be the one to tempt fate and to play with the duckies? Do I need to send them a ducky? I don't know. Maybe you could send them a ducky. I'm not sure if they want more duckies. You mess with a ducky, you're cursing the show. Do they need more duckies to keep track of? I'm just saying. But, duckies. 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 Now... Or I, I don't, I must have trimmed this, I don't know how, oh wait, no, I, uh, yeah, I, I skipped an entire paragraph. The Orpheum Theater is regularly featured on most haunted lists for Arizona, and it's, uh, it has a reputation, uh, it's a reputation that they embrace as well. For several years, the theater has hosted ghost tours during the Halloween season, so if you ever find yourself in Phoenix during the spooky season, be sure to check them out. Be noted that their uh, ghost tours do sell out like the drop of a hat. Yeah. Pete, they're a pretty hot ticket. They only do them a few days out of the year, peak spooky season, so people love to check them out. Um, and they will share ghost stories that you did not hear tonight because I, I give them a lot of credit. They keep their ghost stories 
very close to their chest. So looking for some of the ghost stories from the Orpheum, what I found was like really kind of raking back some of the dark corners of the internet because they, they are not out there. They're not published. They share them on their ghost tour and they want people to come and take their ghost tour if you want to hear those stories. So uh, kudos to them. Yep. So, but yes, that is our last story for this evening. We hope that you enjoyed our tales from the desert southwest. Excuse my yawning. I say desert. It's not just desert. Arizona, there's a lot of desert, but then they got mountains. They got, like, pine tree forests. There's a lot going on out there. Yep. It's kind of a pretty state. Yep. It is a pretty state. Except Drew. Hmm? Except Drew. Except I, I think, I don't know. I the, the 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 picture that I had for like our, our cover on this, it was it's a picture of Jerome. We're Richmonders. We are. We're Richmonders. And like from what I saw from Ghost Adventures, uh Jerome and, and Richmond and Stan look look kinda of, look kinda of similar to me at least. Um my little sister she, yeah, she was raised here, but she's very much not a Richmonder. <laughs> So perhaps the appeal wasn't there. Maybe. It could be. But uh, Alex had a question. So question of the evening. I, I, I like this. This this new thing. Ooh, Al room sack. Throw, uh, without giving away details, better experienced while in attendance, what are your favorite tours that you provide around RVA and why? Oh. Oh, my. Oh. <sighs> That's a tough one. So... I, what I tell everybody is that each of our tours very much stands on their own. If we didn't think a tour was good, we wouldn't offer it. Yeah. Um, that's... Case in point, we have taken down the tour before until we got more uh, stories and could flesh it out better, and then we brought it back. So. Yeah, and no, no hiding anything. It was the Phantoms of Franklin yeah. tour. When we first rolled that one out, we struggled to make that tour last an hour. Um, now we easily got an hour and a half. <laughs> easily got an hour and a half. And, Unless uh, you're Lee, in which case, boy, they can talk. <laughs> yeah, but um, but yeah, easily goes an hour and a half. And there are a couple of stories that we uh, you know kind of hold in reserve that we don't necessarily even share on it all the time. So um, yeah, all of our tours are fantastic, and for different reasons as mm -hmm. well. Um, of course, you know, there's different chapters of history, different chapters uh, of you know different types of ghosts, different goes from different eras all across the city. Um, I, I, I personally, I actually like our new tour, uh, Shades and Specters. That one's found a new spot in my heart. Mm -hmm. Shades and Specters is a great tour. Um, I, I have a soft spot for the, the new one, our uh, Creepy Tales on Campus. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, Again, it's another one that when we first did the first round for it, we're like, okay, this works, but it's not there yet. Mm -hmm. And then I found three new stories, and I'm like, now we're there. Yep. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the, the campus is just, it's the yep. VCU Munner Park campus. It's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, lots of, you know, historic buildings from the, Gil, you know, Richmond's Gilded Age. Um, you know, very interesting stories as well. Um, and, but that's, I, I don't want to say that because, you know, at the same time I kind of feel it almost takes away from some of my other favorites. I, I got yeah. a soft spot for Churchill. We live in Churchill. We, we found, found this house. We found this house well, she was giving the Churchill Chillers tour. So, I mean, you know, there's always that aspect of things. Um, Capitol Hill, the architecture, the his history and the architecture on the Capitol Hill is just the astounding. The stories that we've been mm -hmm. given yep. access to by former Capitol Police officers that we don't even tell because it's just so much information. Mm -hmm. And then I, mean, I tell different stories every time I do Capitol Hill. Okay. I, I do, yeah. like, a just sort of... A round of that. Mm -hmm. I need to start bringing in more Paul Hopes. Stories. Well, that's what I do. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I just I need I know when I give the tour I need to start bringing in more. Oh yes. Yeah. Like he like you can like you can basically do the main Capitol building as vignettes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. That's what I do. Yeah, and uh, the the other thing is um I mean, well, we kind of need them to finish construction on Capitol Hill. Yeah, so we can actually have more access to yeah. various parts of it. Yeah. We, we can do our basic tour without a problem, but um, the idea of adding in anything that's on the far side of Capitol Square has been eluded us for a couple of years now. Yeah, because of water issues they've been having and trying to fix. Yeah. And, um, you know, we've mentioned that's five of the six we've mentioned, of course. Then there's always our classic. There's Shadows. Shadows, Shadows of Shaco. Shadows of Shaco. Um, it, 
amazing stories down there. It's the city's oldest neighborhood. I mean, how could there not be amazing stories? Yeah. So, you know. The way I see it, um, Haunts of Richmond is a very neat variety of things, and every ghost tour has something different to offer. So, like, if you're a history nut, mm -hmm. you're going to want to take the Churchill one, because that is super-duper heavy on history. Yeah. Every stop has so much packed into it. Mm -hmm. Um, if you want the classic short ghost stories from, like, ten years ago, take uh, Shaco Bottom, because that was all the first ones that we researched. Like, uh, Scott was going into businesses asking yeah. questions. Yeah. That, and Capitol Hill. Yeah, and Capitol Hill. Yeah, they were together. Well, they were one tour. Yeah, the and first, also with the, the book. Yes. Yeah. Well. The first two years of Haunts of Richmond's existence, there was one tour. It was called Shadows of Shaco, but it took you from Shaco Bottom up to Capitol Square and back. So it took a year of convincing the founders that we have enough material for to split. Yep. Yeah. So first first <laughs> I won. They they are so they are so stubborn. Yeah. <laughs> I love them. Shadow Shadows of Shaco runs in 2005, 2006 as the only tour that we had and it went mm -hmm. up to Capitol Square. 2007 they finally break off Capitol Square. So you have Shadows of Shaco and Haunted Capitol Hill. 2009, they introduced Churchill Chillers. Um, then that's where Phantoms of Franklin starts coming into play. Well, we brought in the Pub Crawl after that. Uh, the, now, Pub Crawl was also started in 2009. Yeah, so, so. Pub Crawl came in, and then they started researching the Phantom Store, and... They ran that for, like, two years. I forget exactly what two years. I want to say, like, 2013 and 14, yeah. something like that. And then one... Then we shelved it. Shelved it. Because um, we knew it wasn't working. We knew we didn't have enough material. And uh, that's how things were until then we took over the company starting in 2016. Mm -hmm. Yeah. January 2016, we take over the company and we... We immediately started researching. We started researching, but we coasted for like the first year. Yeah. Um, just kind of getting our bearings. Um, figuring and things out. Figuring <laughs> things out. And then... VCU called us and wanted us to do VCU Family Weekend in 2017. Um, actually, well, we did, in 2016, they called us, we did Capitol Hill for them that year. Yeah. Then, even though that went fairly well, we decided we wanted to do something closer to their campus. And so we, we had, brought back Phantoms. We brought back Phantoms. That and was it, my first year. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and it, that worked out well because they weren't looking for a full, like, 90-minute tour. They were looking for something that ran about an hour, and we hadn't fully fleshed out Phantoms yet. So, perfect. Perfect fit. We did Phantoms of Franklin for them, um, and uh, we did actually, we, we continued doing the research. We brought back Phantoms of Franklin as a full-fledged tour once we had some more stories. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, then we decided that we wanted something even closer, really, to VCU's campus on VCU's yeah. campus. So, so we, Creepy Tales on Campus. Creepy Tales before. on Campus, which we launched this past October. And then, um, in part, with our partnership that we have with the John Marshall House, that is when we um, fleshed out Court End. Mm -hmm. And now we offer the, starting Friday, we are going to start offering the Spirits yeah. and Shades of Court End. Not to the exclusion of the John Marshall House, we will still do yeah. that sometimes as a special event, but um, yeah. In addition, so we got a lot going on. Um, we are not on next Monday. No, we are two on weeks. the following Monday. Yeah, so we're gonna get, ba yeah. get back on our normal schedule, back on the two week schedule. Mm -hmm. And what is it in two weeks? Um, uh, I got it right here. Now that I, I rambled on for like 10 minutes. But anyways, uh, <laughs> Illinois. Hey, I've been there. Yep. Where do you want to stake that been to, guys? <laughs> Haunted Illinois. Oh, we're gonna, I have stuff for we're, you. We are going to hit that in two weeks. On the 19th. I have stuff for you about Illinois. Good deal. Well, we, will, we will chat once we, once we get off the air here. Yeah. But, yeah, so you can tune in for that in uh, two weeks' time. Uh, and then, let's see. New yeah. York after that. Haunted New York. Yep, we got uh, we got our next few few shows uh, lined up, but uh, we do have to get Massachusetts in there soon. Yes, yeah, so I'm shocked you haven't done that. Massachusetts? Yeah. I mean, we haven't, we haven't. We did an entire show just on Salem. Yep. And, and then, we've also done Haunted New England, which not was Boston. Part of, 
Specific. Not not specifically Boston. Some, of the, some things in Boston I have been done on other shows. I actually have to look it up. Yeah. Though. I don't recall which ones we've done in Boston. Oh, I think it was a hotel. Boston is okay. just so, like, haunted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, I think it was a hotel that we did in Boston. So, we'll, we'll, it was either a hotel or a restaurant. Yeah. But yeah, sometime, probably, it might be looking at what we got on the agenda here. I mean, here. I can adjust the ones we haven't announced yet. Yeah. I'm looking, we got stuff scheduled through the end of August, but we're not going to announce it yet in case we want to change course. Yeah. So. That, but, that was me just trying to be logical and get things set up. It's like, oh, these are the scripts I need to work on. Yeah. <laughs> we got stuff. Silly logic. So. But yeah. So we got, uh, yeah, Illinois. We got New York over the next couple of shows. And. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. All right. So with that, we're going to. What? What's coming up? What's happening? Uh, um, um, well, anything? We're running... Nothing this next two months. We're running okay. seven days a week. Uh, oh, oh, no, July we're doing the um, Summer Ween. Summer Ween. It's uh, going to be like a... Oh, it's a summer Halloween-y type vendor thing. Right. That's going to be at Oddballs. Yep. Oddballs Antiques, which is just off of West Broad Street. Um, it's the 22nd? Um, something like that. I don't or, have my calendar in front of me because it's or, charging. Over in Henrico, um, I feel, oh, so, oh yeah, that's right, the week, so let's see, the week before that, we are doing, our friends at Rich Brow are hosting uh, a, a beer music mm -hmm. festival day on July 15th, so we're doing that that day, but then the 22nd is summer week. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, we're also doing trivia at well, Zoe's doing oh, trivia yes. at Rich Brow yeah. yep. this week. This coming Thursday? Yes. This Thursday, so check that out. Yep. And, um, and you know what? Heck, I'm going to go ahead and plug the Richmond Shakespeare Festival because School for Lies has been getting some <laughs> seriously wonderful reviews, so go see it. I've not seen it yet, but I heard it's great. And one of my friends is in it, and he hasn't been in a show in Richmond in a bit. So. Yeah. But, yeah, we do, uh, do love the... Uh, the Shakespeare Festival. Rich, Richmond Shakespeare and Love the festival them. that they do over at um, Agecroft. Uh, yeah, and one of my memories popped up today when we were last picnicking there and having going up to the theater. It's been a while. We need to. It has there. been. I don't remember the last time we did it. Yeah, we need Probably to. at least three or four years now. It was pre COVID. It's a shame. Yeah. But, well, yeah, COVID wiped out a year. Well, next week, next next month is a uh, comedy fairs. Yeah. Uh, right now it's School for Lies, um, which is a little more modern, but. From what I understand, incredibly hilarious. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, Patrick, we've had the Richmond Shakespeare Festival out there for over twenty years now. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, um, it's been going for it's a while. pretty awesome. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, if you ever want to check out Richmond Shakespeare, or is it? Is it's it? Richmond Shakes. Shakes. Now. Shakes. Okay, mm -hmm. I was gonna say. They've gone through a couple of name changes, but yeah. now it's Richmond Shakes officially. They did what? Quill well, for a little bit. Quill Henry. Sh okay, so the the really the big one was. Uh, Richmond Shakespeare and Henley Street Theater, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. they decided to short it to Quill. <laughs> yeah, Quill, and now it's Richmond Shakes. Yeah. So, yeah, but yes, Richmond highly, Shakes. Highly recommend going to it. Though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to think. There's always there's always something going on. It is it's festival some, season. It's festival yeah, season. Festival. So well, like they just had the Greek festival this past weekend. Yeah. Pride is happening a lot. Yeah. Oh, uh, Poe Museum Pride on the last Thursday this month. Is, oh, is that the their, their um, on is that their unhappy hour theme this month? Mm -hmm. oh, good for them. I'm pride. Which we we should definitely try to make it. You're away. You're uh, in Florida, like and I'm running the show myself that week. You can, you can go. I don't in think your I'm volunteering. Time. I think I'm like just gonna be like <laughs> popping in. I might um, be collapsing with a beer that night. <laughs> they're gonna have beer at unhappy hour. I'm it's just the 20 saying. Second. Anyway. All right. Uh, so yes, um, I, I know that uh, our friends at Vibe Radio Network are going to be kicking us off here in a couple of minutes, and we are kind of getting to the point of just rambling. But do keep an eye on social media. We if um, we'll, we will go ahead and post stuff as it 
as it comes around and stuff like that if there's anything that we're forgetting. Also, you can go ahead, you can subscribe to our newsletter, which I only send out like literally probably once every other month or something. So Because we're busy. Because we're busy and I am not going to inundate anybody with the uh, emails. That's all the emails. Yeah. So we made that promise when we started the newsletter. Yep. Yeah. And if you want to subscribe to it, really easy, you can go to hauntsofrichmond.com, which is just our website, and you will it's see subscribe. at the well actually at the top in the bar, you will see the tab that says newsletter. You can go there, put in your email address, and boom, 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 you are signed up for our newsletter. So, we got that going on, and as I said, we're going seven nights a week now. So you can come on out and check out a tour just about every night of the week. I think there are a couple of scattered nights here or there through the summer months that we will not be open for various reasons, whether we've been Usually fireworks season. Fireworks or we've been booked out for private a tours. private tour or something. But anyways, yeah, we're more or less open seven days a week now. So you can go and check out our calendar, also on the website, hauntsofrichmond.com. And with that... We will say goodnight. We will we bid, you all a, <laughs> bid you all a adieu. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show as much as we did. And uh, yeah, we'll see you back here at the two very weeks. least. Two, two weeks. weeks. Haunted Illinois. So until then, Yay. have a good night, everybody. Yeah, so you're saying hi, here's all the fun stuff.